everybody. Welcome once again to another installment of A Rebel Without Applause, coming to you as I always do from this, my little nutshell of infinite space, my television studio apartment located right here in the wood of my holly in the little creative crow's nest called Cretona, under the sign overlooking the COVID-addled and smoke-choked, yet still somehow enchanted land of law. I'm here today with a very special guest. He is a very important person in the social justice movement. He lived and presided over religious congregations in the San Fernando Valley, but now I'm very happy to have him with me right now. That's Rabbi Stephen Jacobs. Welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful to be together and to share memories and a a long journey together with you, your, your family, because the first time when I moved here, your parents reached out and introduced me to Lake Tahoe. So that's been a great influence in my life of place where I went to create and sculpt and create sermons and, uh, and spent a lot of time in the lake, on the lake, and, uh, and doing a lot of walking and reflecting. So that was a major, major influence in my life, and it, it had to do uh, with your parents. I was up at Lake Tahoe a few weeks ago. I'm a fly fishing addict, and I have to say it felt like it was nuclear winter there now with the fires right. and the smoke. It's, it's but re- did you catch anything? Of course I did. I, I'm, I'm an avid fly fisherman, but I, I generally fish in the rivers, the little Truckee and right. the Truckee uh, River. I just love uh, the eastern slope of the Sierra Nevada and the Owens River and Mono County, and it's just the magical geography of our state. And I should say, you've come to know this state in a way probably that you, you never thought you would because that's of— That's true. That is true. You've mm-hmm. reincarnated yourself in, in some fashion. I guess you're you're no longer presiding over a temple, but you're you've made a, a cool transition in, into the political world. I moved here in 1970 with my family to become the rabbi of Temple Judea in Tarzana, having uh, left Miami during uh, the fraught times of the Vietnam War. I brought that spirit out to California. But I spent, you know, all those years in the valley and, you know, basically vacationing and spending time at Tahoe. But I didn't know the state until 10 years ago when I started traveling with my wife, who's the controller of the state, Betty Yee. What is the term of a controller in California? There are two terms, and then you're you're termed out. So she's in her second term, is that correct? She's in her second term, has two years left. And they're four-year terms. And they're coincidental with the governor's elections? Correct. Okay. And for those of people that don't know, the controller, it's an elected office. And I don't know if that's unique to California or not, but just talk about what that experience is like, her responsibilities and how it's influenced you just transitioning from the pulpit to politics. Well, just as as an introduction, I was always involved in the political arena from the pulpit, and that served me well. Not everybody agreed, but I never told anybody who to vote for, but everybody knew my articulation of liberal values and reaching out to the community. And I had lots of support and was able to travel the world in terms of political situations, went on several congregational trips to Israel. That was more about the history, but also took trips to Russia with a group from the congregation to meet with the refuseniks to get them out of Russia. And then I was involved with interfaith groups and traveled to different hot spots of the world. I did a lot of travel with Reverend Jesse Jackson, mm-hmm. uh, both here and in, in, in America. So I was aligned with liberal values and very passionate about equality and social justice. So then I translated that in the pulpit. And then when uh, my wife uh, was elected, she was a member of the Board of Equalization before she ran for controller and had been involved was on uh, Governor Gray Davis's staff. She was uh, uh, essentially his chief financial officer there and then moved on to become the controller. And I, having, you know, spent my career in politics, it was natural when I originally met her, and this was 11, 12 years ago, I started doing volunteer work particularly in the L.A. area, and then moved, and then both of us were free, and it developed into a very close relationship, and eventually we were we were married, and I became her political director and traveled the state and still do that to this day. 
with people reaching out that want our endorsements and communicating with people all over the state. So to me, it's a particular joy and it was something natural to move from the pulpit into retirement, but doing the political work for, for my wife. And, uh, and I continue to do interfaith work and, and work with rabbis and, and clergy. California is, is such a diverse state politically, racially, economically. I mean, you've got Adam Schiff and Devin Nunes only a, less than a few hundred miles apart, their respective True. districts. How do you like talk to people that maybe you don't necessarily agree with or are disposed maybe to dislike you or whatever you represent? It's a difficult question, but I, I try really not to judge. If I'm meeting people, I mean, there are certain segments of California that they can't stand politicians. So it's very difficult to communicate on that level. But I have I have lots of friends um, like you and family. People differ. Um, I never get involved in, in trying, to, uh, trying to mow somebody down in terms of their particular views. But I I must say that among some of my Republican friends, and and we have many amongst them who were very, you know, wonderful, I would say wonderful, they were Trump supporters, uh, have now very much moved out of that milieu and don't accept his leadership anymore. So um, it's not difficult with people. I have some friends with whom I grew up. I have a a friend, a dear friend in San Francisco. We grew up together. We were in kindergarten together. And he's the most supportive of Trump, of of all the people that I know. Economically, he's a huge success. And uh, and we have these rich conversations, but we never we never dump on one another. You know, I mean, we'll we'll give each other a little bit of uh, what they call in Judaism a shtuch, uh, <laughs> about our our views. But we get along and. Uh, I don't get into a, a pissing match, and I know that what I speak of and how I handle these situations is very different from families who have really broken up. They, you know, I mean, you hear lots of stories that are true about Thanksgiving or Christmas or or Jewish holidays when families sit down to meals and they get into these huge arguments and people yell and scream and walk out. That's not unusual. I'm not involved in that, and I wouldn't be involved in that. Maybe that's one of the advantages of the silver linings of COVID is that people can't sit at these dinner tables and hate each other. Yeah, well, no. <laughs> they have to maintain distance, so, you no. know. <laughs> no, I mean, that that's true, but it, it's still there, and, and the, you know, it, it's not, I, I would call it an inelegant way of communicating with each other and putting each other down and families and, and you know, families are just broken up. You know, they, yeah. they are broken up about it. Um, in my, my family, my kids and my grandchildren, thank goodness, they're pretty much on the same page. We have great communications and, and they get it. So when I say they get it, they get what, what we embrace in terms of what a, a civil society is and what the leadership of this country is about. And we have lots of talks about, about Biden and, and Kamala, et cetera. Well, you must be no Ka- uh, Kamala because she's from the Bay Area and she, uh, yep. you know, was, uh, I guess, in the same building or pretty close to uh, Betty. I mean, yeah, she was yeah. the attorney general here. Right. So I'll tell you a cute story. Go so ahead. her her husband, Doug Emhoff, yeah. um, whom she married, uh, happens to be of our faith, happens to be, you know, Jewish. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we're backstage at a uh, Democratic convention, California Democratic Convention, and Betty and Kamala are off talking privately, and Doug and I standing there. So we started kidding each other that we should write a book about two Jewish boys who married Asian women. We didn't do it. We won't do it. But it was a cute a cute moment together. Well, the possibilities of cross-cultural outreach romantically, personally, to me, that's when my life gets richer. One of the things that I love about L.A. is... I play jazz in the black community every Thursday night. Uh My family is heavily vested in the Iranian and the Hispanic community. I lived just a few blocks from Thai town. I just feel like integrate yourself because guess what? Your life gets so much better. It's so much. This is the gift of America. Yeah. Personally, personally, it's very interesting. Even as a rabbi over the years, many years, a lot of what I would call 
have called interfaith relationships, were intercultural relationships, and so many of the marriages that I performed happened to be between Asians and Jews. We have so much in common that goes back thousands of years to the Silk Road, to uh, the values that we share in terms of education, food, etc. Yeah, and it's so just it's, so much uh, more fun. Life is yeah, better. Yeah. You, and of course, you, you know, Jews automatically, because of our love for Chinese food, that's automatic. There was a place called Ho Toys on Van Nuys Boulevard. We'd I, go. I used to go there all the time. <laughs> we were all a, the time. You know, when I was a kid, that was like my intro, first introduction to Chinese culture. I remember, culture. that was upstairs, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then on Sunday nights, we would go downtown. There was a place, uh, it escapes me for the moment, but every Sunday night, we used to go downtown and we had the greatest Chinese food, which was inexpensive, and it was filled with Jews. I know. I wanted to see congregants <laughs> that I didn't see during the year, except in the high holidays. I would see them on Sunday night at the uh, Chinese restaurant downtown L.A. It's so much more fun. Life is so much better. And I think Thank you. in the Thank you. Jewish community, you know, we have have this history of the ghetto, you know, of, of mm -hmm. being of these walls. But, you know, some of those walls are self-constructed, you know, if, if you know what I mean. I mean— we, I know what you mean very well. I grew up that way. You know, and the the really the triumph of my happiness is, and I didn't even understand it about myself early on, but is to break out of the walls, the same, the suburban sameness of the valley had a corrosive effect on me. I wanted to, I didn't even understand it, but I knew there was like a more interesting world than just, I don't know, those this, just that suburban sameness. And well, that's why I was in favor of busing in the in the 70s and 80s. It was a tough call, particularly for the Jewish community, but I believed in it passionately. But then my whole life has been surrounded by the values in the, in the African-American community from the time that I was nine years old growing up in Boston. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that, because this social justice movement really was galvanized around the black struggle. It was instructive mm -hmm. to all the other struggles, in fact. And talk about how that started for you in, in the 1960s and how it dovetailed. Well, it, started, it started much earlier. Okay. Um, in 19, I was nine years old growing up in Boston and, and I grew up in, basically in Brookline. And my grandparents, who came from Russia, lived in Roxbury, Dorchester, a tough part of Boston. But every Sunday morning, I would go to my maternal grandparents' home and I would play outside. I mean, this was, you know, I was nine years old and I had a, which was called then a Negro friend. And we would just play in the streets, play ball, whatever we were doing. And one Sunday morning, as we're playing outside, there's a, a man coming down the street and he get, as he gets closer, he starts yelling and screaming as he gets real close. And I'm going to curse, and you can either cut this out or not, but I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. As he gets closer to us, he starts yelling, get the fuck out of the way, you little nigger. And I was like, oh. I, I went ballistic internally. I'm nine years old. I ran into my grandparents' home crying, screaming what just happened. I never heard the word fuck. I never heard the word nigger. I never was exposed to anger, to tell you the truth. And my father sat me down and said, tell me what happened. My father was an Orthodox Jew. My grandparents were Orthodox Jews. Um, my father sat me down and said, sit there. And he took off. And even though my father was um, <laughs> was an Orthodox Jew, he was a man that I learned from very early. If there's any injustice in the world, he's going to stand up to it, you know, both emotionally and physically. He came back. He smiled at me. He never told me anything. But I, I could imagine that he probably beat the guy up. OK, that's mm -hmm. my father. He was, kind of, he was a small guy, but he was a pugilist. And he grew up in the streets. And that's where I learned about social justice. And I went to my rabbi and I told him what happened. And he was so compassionate. I'll, I'll use the, the word that we're using today of empathy. He was filled with empathy and he hugged me. And I came home at nine years old and said, I want to be a rabbi. I knew something was wrong in the world. I couldn't quite articulate it, but that started me and I never turned around that this was going to be my life's work to, to follow justice. And uh, although I grew up in this observant home, uh, my parents were very open to my learning. And uh, I was attracted to the prophets. Of course, they were 
their lives were dwelt with Micah and Jeremiah who went to jail and, and Isaiah who all stood up for justice and they became my heroes and, and how I followed them. And then it would have been natural for me to go to an Orthodox seminary or a conservative seminary, but I was drawn to the reform movement, which at that time were builders in the in the social justice movement. They were the ones, uh, Kivy Kaplan, who actually was one of the original people that started the NAACP, so it was Jews involved. So it was a natural attraction for me to go to Hebrew Union College, the Reform Seminary, and that's been my life. I just interviewed Claiborne Carson. That was my previous podcast. He's head of the Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King Institute. And so Mm -hmm. I've been doing a deep dive into this territory myself, and I have come to know through the research of a script I wrote called The Children, Reverend James Lawson, who to me, and we spoke about this just a second ago, he should be on Mount Rushmore. He's probably the most important and least known advocate uh, for social justice that that I've ever come across. Well, people in the movement, you know, know him at John Lewis's funeral. John had called him Mm -hmm. a few weeks before he died and said, Jim, I want you to come and speak at my funeral. And, um, And James Lawson was the greatest influence of Martin Luther King's life. He taught Martin Luther King and John Lewis and the whole group of them Uh, He taught them the whole theory of nonviolence. Martin Luther King did not know that. He embraced it after Reverend Lawson taught it to him. And you're right, James is probably least known uh, dramatically around America uh, in dramatic kinds of ways of what his, his life work has been and continues to be, his influence. But I have to tell you that within the movement, particularly in the African-American community, they love, they adore, and they they have learned to this day who Jim Lawson is and the influence not only on America but beyond. And his great influence of the gift of nonviolence is what he brought to Martin Luther King and to America in particular. And the term Satyagraha is the sort of mm-hmm. pivotal yep. Gandhian term. The, mm-hmm. you know, I've, always, we learned it. I've often struggled with the term nonviolence because it just describes to the layman person the absence of violence as opposed to something more affirmative and deeper that's really going on, like this soul force to try and reach and love that person that would do you harm at the same time you're confronting them. That seems... Defining the right term has always been a struggle. So I just settled with Satyagraha because... Uh, Well, I have to tell you something. I made a big mistake. I should have had much greater influence in your life because you would have made a great rabbi. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm pre, this is my pulpit here. I'm preaching. Now, I don't know if I'm preaching. I know, I know it is. And that's (laughs) exactly, exactly why I say that, because you have not only profound thoughts, but you act on them. And uh, I'm just proud to be part of your journey. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. And I'll just say this. I loved your sermons and you know, I, I, t- I don't, I don't want to quote a relative, but, you know, what is it with the, the politics and the pulpit? I don't need the, the politics. Just give me the religion, the old-time religion. I go, well, what, what do you think Martin Luther King was doing? I mean, what, so much of the social progress or the abolitionists and the Quakers has originated from these little places, these churches, even Lawson's <laughs> workshops were in the basement of a church. And if, if you look at his disciples, John Lewis, Diane Nash, Bernard Lafayette, James Bevel, those people, I mean, it's like he was, he's like Red Arbach, you know? It's like... <laughs> I, thank you. I, I can talk about that, too. Yeah, I mean, you're talking talk about, about an all-star... Arbach, you okay, can talk about an all-star team. Wow. Come on. Do you smoke a cigar when you know that you've done a good job? Yeah. Like Red Arbach? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, but I've had the experience of sitting in the congregation and people walking out of me. There's no no question about that. So I knew I was successful when people got up and walked out. Yeah, well, you were, and you are. And I, it seems to me that this transition... That, but most people stayed, but, the, you know, they were tolerant. <laughs> oh, yeah. I loved you all along. You know, I just... I You did not bar mitzvah me. I was a little older, and ironically, the, the guy that I guess preceded you, Hirschberg... He, right. I felt like this guy reminded me of like I didn't had I haven't seen any photographs of Moses, but I thought he probably looked something like this guy. Well, he was he was a German Jew, but let me tell you about him. He was a humanist, uh-huh. and he believed in humanistic Judaism and wrote about it, wrote a book about it. 
And I had a lot of respect for that because coming out of Germany and a lot of them, you know, stayed and became Orthodox rabbis. So he was on the cutting edge, a little bit, commu- you know, difficult to communicate with, but he was an unusual man. And he was but actually... Young people, young people had a difficult time, but, you he, know, he was... Yeah, he was the rabbi for my mother, my grandmother right. in New Rochelle, uh-huh. where they that's were right. from. That's right. Uh-huh. You know, and that's an interesting thing. It's always, is this, um, the secular, the reform, this idea of assimilation that actually, I think, had its origins in Germany, where you first started to see Jews in Europe join the general flow of the cultural life of the country. Ironically, that's where fascism blew up, too. Mm-hmm. But it seems like that secular movement, that desire to be part of the, the great flow of a country's life was part and parcel of reform or secular Judaism. It's why I wanted to prove that I could play baseball and be Jewish too, that I could play football, that I was as tough as any kid in my neighborhood. And it didn't matter that I was a Jewish kid, you know, this sort of nebbishy idea, this stereotype. My hero was Sandy Koufax, you know, th- those, th- that, I don't know, there's like this continuum or thread that was very powerful to me as a kid. So this is a cute story, and I believe it's true. Do you remember the football player Sid Luckman? Of course, quarterback, Chicago Bears. Right. So Sid Luckman, his mother went to a game. Uh, I don't know if this is apocryphal enough, but I've always remembered it. So she finally went to a football game, and he was uh, running with the ball, and his mother yelled out, run the other way, they'll hurt you, Sid. Run the other way. (laughs) Yeah. Well, he ran right into the Hall of Fame is where he ended up. Right, that's true. That's true. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, there's, I don't know, Jewish football players. There's not a ton of them, but he was probably the, well, you know. No, no, there there are, you know, with with the Patriots. Oh, yeah, Edelman, Edelman. 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 Julian Edelman. Yes, he's great. Yes. Yeah, Yeah, and the baseball, of course, Hank Greenberg uh, was... Lots, lots. Yes, and now more. In our congregation, even though he never converted to Judaism, Ron Say was married to Fran. They were members of the temple. I was very close with Ron and the family, and uh, they always came to services, high holiday services, and Ron while he never embraced another religion, was most comfortable in Judaism. But there were, there were, you know, many, many who, uh, Al Rosen. Right. I knew his son, Jim. Huh? Jim Rosen. So, I mean, we could yeah. go through. Yeah. We could go through. Baseball was welcoming to Jewish players. And basketball was, uh, the first generation of great basketball players were, were many were Jewish, a lot of them. Mm-hmm. The, the Shays, Dolph Shays. And then you mentioned your grandfather was a pugilist. There were a lot of Jewish fighters. My father, my father. Oh, your father. There were a lot yeah. of Jewish fighters. I guess the most famous one would be Benny Leonard, you know. That's the... right. That's right. I actually met him. Really? Mm-hmm. That's funny you should mention that, because my father and introduced me to him in New York. Well, that's a memory I'd forgotten about. <laughs> yeah, so with, there's you a... really know. You, you just, you're amazing to be with. Oh, well, likewise, man. I, you know, I love the whole historical and political canvas, you know, and I've, I've been fortunate as a comedian to be able to just take a look. I'm reading now this guy, and he's so, so important. He's the most overlooked person in American history. And of course, that's W.E.B. Du Bois. He's only like generations ahead of every other historian. We're just catching up to him now. I mean, it's... It's, uh, This is... This is an amazing com- conversation. I'm loving it. Oh, likewise. Thank you. I just finished Reconstruction in America, which is, if you don't read that, if you don't, the, it's the most misunderstood period in American history because it ha- offers the most promise and the most tragedy uh, in the 10 years after the Civil War, which brings me to a subject that uh, maybe we can kick around a little bit. And, you know, my mom was a beneficiary of this. She was born in Germany as a young girl. They were refugees and her education was uh, interrupted and her life was dislocated, for which she received from the German government reparations, which to me begs A very important question is, we have this historical inequity uh, that's just staring us in our faces. What's your feeling about, you know, restorative justice by way of reparations in the United States? Um, I've I've come along, well, I, I was never against it, but now, particularly in this day and age, I've come to understand the importance of it even more. The, the reparation should be poured into, into African-American communities rather than individuals. 
to support the reconstruction of community or the construction and reconstruction of of communities which have been ill served. So in a in, in just in a sentence or two, I become and I do embrace reparations on that on that level. Yeah, I did too. Some sort of collective effort towards restorative justice seems to be mm-hmm. the way forward. And of course, you know, you're talking about integrations in the school. That was a an attempt towards restorative justice of some sort, but it provoked a very powerful reaction mm-hmm. as well. I don't. Mm-hmm. I know. I know. But I, I'm a, I'm a great believer in it now. In integration. No, in integration and in in terms of reparations for the for the black community. I am too. I'm not quite sure the how of it. You know, what's the most practical? No, I mean these are good good discussions. Cory Booker is kind of leading the way, and it'd be interesting to see what Kamala does with it if she's elected, even if she's not elected. You know, uh, being on the cutting edge of this now, so I think there are good discussions taking place. And here's a question I have for you about the Jewish tradition, and that is, where does Satyagraha, or the soul force, or this nonviolence, where can we see examples of it inside the Jewish tradition? It goes back to biblical times. I mean, there's no question that a lot of it, there is a lot of warfare that goes on, but there were peacemakers, you find in the prophets, uh, uh, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So there were there were uh, times in Judaism, there were people, uh, even in the Jewish community, who were against um, what was going on during the time of Hitler. That was unusual. But you do have a strain of peacemakers, and uh, you, have, you have different biblical and post-biblical concepts of warfare is not the way that we're going to move forward. So you have that, that strain in Judaism, which goes back to biblical times, but you also have, I mean, you have that on one hand, and you do have what is justifiable war, and there are long discussions about what are just wars. So that would be the answer to your question, and those have to be studied. Those texts have to be studied. But there is a whole discussion amongst the rabbis of what is a just war and what is not. You just can't automatically go to war. And then maybe on the alternative side of that, what you're saying is there are rare occasions in our history that that war is justified. Just personally, I went through a lot in terms of the Vietnam War and what I was doing. And I was a conscientious objector. And then as a rabbi, I helped many young men who wanted to file for, you know, for the same thing and uh, become conscientious objectors. And uh, I was helpful to them when uh, that was a dangerous thing to do. But I did it. They did it. And I had enormous respect for those who are willing to go through that and go through the damages to one's credibility by wanting to become, you know, uh, take on that stance um, and I myself did it. Well, I'll tell you, you know, apropos of that, I, I sometimes get, you said I should, could have been a rabbi. Yeah, you could have been a contender. You should have been a rabbi. But I've often asked at my mom's house to, to preside over the Passover thing, you know, and um, the Exodus story. And I'm mm-hmm. just trying to, well, what am I going to say? You know, I just like reading the book and the questions and all this. I go, well, if you look at the, the Passover story, it's our first example of organized nonviolent resistance to an oppressive force. After all, it's not a story of the Israelites or the Hebrews rising up and killing the Egyptians. No, they make a demand for their freedom. They refuse to to cooperate in their own enslavement, and they leave. I go, wait a minute, this is nonviolence in action. This is social protest. You've answered your own question. There's a great (laughs) example of the question that you asked of nonviolence and how to deal with violence. So yes, thank you. That's a great example. Yeah, so the story, it's hiding in plain sight. Maybe that's why we're repeating it every year for the last Mm -hmm. 5,000. I'm not sure, but... And then I got kind of criticized for that. They go, wait a minute, the plagues and the the, the no, sea no, no. and the but whole there were, thing. there were Israelites, you know, that couldn't stand being out in the in the desert. And there were a number of Israelites, I don't know, percentage who wanted to go back to Egypt uh, and just get, even though they were, you know, they were slaves, to go back to three meals a day. The security. But there was that element within the Israelite community. 
Well, listen, I don't like crossing the desert. I don't even like driving to Palm Springs, so I can get it. You know, it's You're like... too much. You're too much. <laughs> it took them 40 years to get from Egypt to friggin' Israel. It takes me two hours to get I'm to not Palm sure, Springs. By the way, there's a, there's a strain. This is very interesting. There's a strain um, that says that um, the, the reason it took 40 years to go from Egypt to Israel, which is essentially a two day trip, is that they really were going to China. And that the 40 years, that's what it took, was 40 years to go from Egypt to China. And they didn't have GPS. They didn't have any navigational that's devices. That's true. They knew the that's sunset true. in the West, but still it was confusing in the sandstorms. So. Well, the, the great thing about the Jewish community with all of our challenges is we sure as hell know where we've been. And I think by and large, we know where we're going. Well, if you know where we're going, tell me. That's, that's the next podcast. I'll okay. find out between now and the next podcast. <laughs> All right. Well, geez, maybe we could do a second installment of this. Uh, I would be delighted. I've enjoyed every second. Oh, ditto there. Likewise that. Let's do this because we're coming up on a very contentious moment in our history. I believe after this election, we are going to see every institution in the American structure tested to the max to facilitate what I'm hopeful will be a peaceful well, transition. You know what? The, I'll tell you the scariest part of, of Trump, mm -hmm. that he's very capable of scorched earth. Oh, yeah. If you, if you watch his, you know, from the time he was elected to this very day, he's very capable of doing something if he loses this election and he could, you know, just think of who his models are and he could really scorch this earth. It's terrifying. That's why I say the institutions will be tested. Right. By that I mean judges, generals, right. postmasters. Right. These are the people upon which we are going to be standing between the 3rd and the 20th. So, Well, um, thank God there are people like you that, that get this and, and articulate it and are in the public. This is, this is wonderful. I'm very touched by you. Uh, likewise, Steve. I will catch you on the other side. Thank you okay. so much for joining Thanks. me, and we'll do this again for sure. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. So there you have it, folks. A very compelling and cool conversation with Rabbi Steve Jacobs. His journey is an interesting and fascinating one. I'm so pleased that he could share it with me and you all. So till next time, folks. Namaste, shalom, and aloha. Namas, aloha. <laughs>